Okay, so this is the topic of my talk, uh, Aurora, not Aurora Borealis, but actually the Essex Aurora Tsubasa. And uh, our uh, marketing people came up with a pretty long name, which needs a little explanation. In Japanese, Tsubasa means wing. So this is uh, supposedly a device that should uh, make you fly. Well, um, that's uh, what they also came up with. But Googling for Tsubasa brought me up this. So I'm not really sure where the origin of this term is. So Captain Tsubasa is an anime character in Japan, a very famous one. All right. Now, um, first to history. And I hope uh, not yet. All you should remember, we are talking about this kind of a device. The device is a PCI Express card uh, sized um, vector processor um, with memory that you can plug into a PC. That's it. But first to the history, how did it come to this kind of device? Here we are, the beginnings. The first commercial vector computer was the Control Data Corporation, STAR 100. STAR stands for String Array, and it was uh, back then uh, the first uh, kind of vectorized big data processing machine with uh, 100 megaflops performance. It was announced in 1971, so almost 50 years uh, before from now uh, in the past. It was released in 1974, designed by Jim Thornton, and the size you can see on the right-hand side. That's a man standing it be besides one of these machines. It had eight megabytes of core memory with a tremendous latency of 1.28 microseconds and uh, um, watch out, 32-way interleaved memory. This is really strange for that time, or really great achievement. It had a 64-bit processor because it was supposed to run uh, double precision codes, and the processor was running at 25 megahertz. Also, this is pretty good. So this machine was the first one with vector instructions, and the vectorization was pipelined operation. Uh, the vector units were streaming data from memory, processing them, and streaming them back to memory. Um, today, this appears odd, but this was the first way to actually process in a vectorized mode uh, instructions. It had a long setup phase, and of course, the vector length had no limitation because we could stream from memory to memory, and uh, the longer the vector, the better the performance because then you could actually hide the long setup phase of the operation. The memory bandwidth of this was 1.6 gigabytes per second. That gives us a, a, a really great 16 bytes per flop, something you, you won't see anymore, probably. <laughs> um, and for those who don't know what core memory is, core memory is exactly this. It's, it's a grid of wires with tiny little ferromagnetic rings across their uh, uh, nodes where you can store one bit by magnetizing these rings. So it's amazing that they build eight megabytes of this. Now, the CDC Star 100 was not particularly um, successful commercially, but uh, it had a follower which was the Cray-1. This was really the first commercially successful vector computer. Uh, Cray-1 was released in 1976, designed by Seymour Cray, who formerly worked for the Control Data Corporation, and is uh, probably the most well-known supercomputer chassis design, because it looks a little bit like a sofa. And you can see, find this in some, in some uh, computer museums. It had 160 megaflop speak. It had a 64-bit processor running at 80 megahertz. This was quite a progress at that time. And now the big revolution, this one had eight megabytes of bipolar memory with 50 nanoseconds, actually 48 nanoseconds latency. It was, again, 60-way, 16-way interleaved in order to allow uh, the vector processing. The, Big innovation in this machine was 
from the instruction set architecture point of view were the vector registers. So Seymour Cray invented the vector registers and now data was streamed not from memory to the vector units, but from vector registers to vector units. And vector registers were made of static RAM with, I think, six nanoseconds latency. So very, very fast static RAM. Uh, so we had pipeline vector operations back then, and the vector length was 64 elements of 64 bits each. So this is a very huge vector compared to the vector sizes that you see today. Memory bandwidth was, again, 16 bytes per flop. People seem to uh, want to build these uh, tremendous bandwidth machines. And this processor had excellent scalar performance. This was a very big differentiator of the machine. So um, what, um, what you see here is actually the way how such a vector, a pipelined vector unit works. What you see on the right-hand side is um, a vector adder, which gets an instruction issued and uh, consumes data from the vector registers A and B while delivering the results into vector register C. So now you see that it is running, it is with one instruction issue, we would do one decode, uh, you are triggering 64 ads in 64 cycles. And of course, this has some latency, but um, uh, basically, the benefit of this was that it could pretty well hide memory latency uh, and uh, um, by, by this pipelining process. And of course, the vector unit was busy or is busy for 64 cycles, which means we trigger, we issue one instruction and we keep it busy doing meaningful operations for 64 cycles. This is a good thing. The other big step uh, introduced in this machine was um, something called vector chaining. Vector chaining is very similar to register bypassing today. On the left side, you see the no chaining uh, processing. You'd see load and add a store, uh, or actually you have multiple loads. Anyhow, uh, if you don't have chaining, you have to wait for the last element to finish before starting the dependent operation. With vector chaining, you start the dependent operation once the first result is available, so you can chain the operations together and your execution time is, is going down a lot. So what happened then to the first type of architecture, the control data, the vector memory memory architectures? Well. There was a pretty successful follower, which was the CDC Cyber, fight, uh, Cyber 205. Uh, this was announced in 1980, and it had up to 400 megaflops, a memory bandwidth of three gigabytes a second. Um, then it was followed by the ETA 10, which was uh, delivered in 1987, uh, up to 10 gigaflops and uh, uh, CMOS technology. So CMOS technology had to be cooled with liquid nitrogen, and by this, um, by this, they could achieve very low memory latency, seven nanoseconds memory latency. But it was still the old design of streaming from memory to memory. And in fact, this was too expensive and couldn't keep up with the reg vector register architectures. So uh, two years later, uh, control data decided to close down ETA and close down this business. And you see in this uh, article that Japanese gain with loss of ETA. Yes, um, uh, NEC was among those who kind of gained. So vector register machines um, did better. So there was a long line of machines coming from Cray Research uh, which was renamed into Cray Computer Corporation, then Cray Research Super Servers, then Cray Inc., and so on. Uh, but this line of computers, of vector computers, went up into 2000, the year 2000, 2000 something. 2005 was the last model released, the X1E, which was a true vector computer. Then we had other companies like Convex, Fujitsu, Hitachi, and NEC. Uh, doing um, the SX series. So vector register machines, as Marek also said in the introduction, were 
were the general purpose supercomputers from the mid 70s to the early 2000s. So uh, they, they were very energy efficient machines. They, their instruction set architecture was exposing data parallelism by design. So the instruction set architecture has evolved over all these years and uh, uh, a lot of fancy features were added to this. Fancy features that you slowly see now uh, replicated in the SIMD machines uh, nowadays. So we had strided loads, gathers, scatters, vector masks, reductions and shuffles. And all this you see today coming slowly into the SIMD machines. Why? Because this is what makes sense to expose data parallelism and to use it in an efficient way. To NEC's uh, supercomputing, uh, vector supercomputers history, um, all the time NEC was actually following um, the high sustained performance uh, motto. So uh, we started doing vector computers, vector supercomputers in about 1980. And uh, back then uh, we had a lot of, well, quite a few uh, innovations along along the time. On the left side, you see you see the machines, you see the technologies um, coming up. The first of these machines in the list was the first machine of about one gigaflops. Um, it was designed, and that uh, he is actually the father of, of this uh, uh, SX supercomputer series at NEC by Tadashi Watanabe. So Tadashi Watanabe is, um, in my eyes, main contribution to, to the computer architectures was the invention of multi-lane pipelines. You will see immediately what it is, and of vector caches. Now we had uh, first uh, CMOS air-cooled vector supercomputer in about 1996. This was a very successful machine. Um, again, I ate byte per flop machine. Um, SX6 was the, uh, the first single chip vector processor for byte per flop machine. And this was the processor of the Earth simulator, which led the, um, the top 500 for something like, I think two years or so. Um, then um, um, another innovation was the vector cache uh, controllable, controllable vector cache called advanced data buffer in about 2009. And then um, you see that the bytes per flop are going down uh, because we can improve compute a lot faster than memory bandwidth. Um, finally, this is the last uh, computer in this family, SX Ace. Um, it's a multi-core vector uh, system on chip. And this one has the best uh, HPCG efficiency with uh, in the range of 10%. So multi-lane vector pipelines that I mentioned are um, uh, built into the NEC vectors since uh, 1989 with the SX3. And what these do is actually combining the concept of SIMD with vector pipeline. Um, so you see in the animation on the right hand side, an instruction issue is now triggering 256 um, operations, well, 256 because the vector registers that we use are have the length of 256. Um, but in the SX3, these uh, vector registers were consisting of four replicated uh, vector registers of length 64. So basically, um, we combine SIMD with, um, with pipelining. And this way we could increase parallelism, but keep the benefits of, of the pipeline vector um, instruction set architecture. What happened then? Then there was a parallel revolution, um, which brought up a lot of massively parallel machines. So the first type of these machines was um, um, were SIMD machines, where um, multiprocessor systems built of pretty simple CPUs were connected into regular meshes together. 
Today, you would call these uh, systolic arrays. And there are machines using this kind of technology on the market today. So the, the, the well-known machines were uh, back then were thinking machines, CM1, CM2, uh, and MassPAR, maybe. Um, these machines were very fast, very nice to use, but pretty limited. I mean, you should, you wanted to have a use case which really fits this architecture. Otherwise, you were, uh, you were in deep trouble. Yeah, so um, these machines evolved into MIMD machines, the massively parallel systems that were using off-the-shelf uh, general-purpose CPUs. Um, representatives of these are, for example, the CM5, the Connection Machine 5, also from Thinking Machines, and the Cray T3D. Um, one with Spark CPUs, the other one with the Alpha, Alpha CPUs. And finally, uh, at the beginning of the 90s, Linux uh, came up, and in 94, the time was ripe for the Beowulf clusters, which really brought a revolution. It still took like 10 years until uh, people took these seriously, but Beowulf clusters are now the design that you find everywhere in supercomputing. And the parallelization uh, paradigms back then were uh, PVM, Parallel Virtual Machine, appeared in 1989, and MPI, the standard nowadays. To a uh, classic discussion in, in these topics, well, uh, recording of the top 500 LINPAC performance uh, started in 1993, and so we don't have actual data from before and the top 500 actually started back then and um, it it actually shows the the time when uh, the vector dominance is passing over to uh, its its leadership to general purpose microprocessors so general purpose cpus as you see the the blue circles in the graph are vector systems and there is one big vector system, which I mentioned before, the R simulator from NEC, that that was uh, uh, leading the that was number one in the top five hundred for one, two, three, four, five, five lists, um, and um, basically uh, the the performance. Well, this uh, the, the number one uh, CPUs. Uh, number one machines were switching from vector machines towards normal general purpose machines. And after the ER simulator, they actually switched over to general purpose machines that were extended to support short vector SIMD. Uh, short vector SIMD is a reinvention of vector technology. It is actually vector technology without the pipelining. Yeah. Uh, back then, uh, there was a need actually to to use the, the silicon that 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 was more and more available from generations of computer of processors, um, and uh, uh, the simplest way to to use it was actually to replicate the units to make them stand just side by side of each other. So SIMD appeared. And now you see on the right hand side that uh, around 2011, specialized CPUs enter the stage. Specialized CPUs like the Xeon Phi, which is a SIMD style CPU, uh, and the GP GPU, with, which is a SIMT uh, CPU. Now, uh, looking at the slopes of the curves, um, I'd also support uh, the the saying that Moore's law slowly ends. Uh, well, it slowly ends despite specialized CPUs. And um, there are people saying that actually deep learning um, and uh, the, the silicon technology together with deep learning and the revolution that deep learning brings is currently fragmenting computing and is uh, 
bringing a kind of a decay of of the the importance of general purpose technology why because we can do a lot with special purpose cpus that's kind of good for us because uh, we also have a special purpose cpu now if you if you look at the top 500s the number ones double performance every about 1.5 1.1 years that is the slope of the main uh, main uh, curve of the number ones but Moore's law actually says that the technology uh, leads to doubling the performance every one. So now I have some slides from the uh, IEEE hot chips um, conference that were introducing the vector engine card. So that is a, a picture of the card. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's a full length, full height card basically consisting of uh, voltage regulators, uh, PCI Express Gen 3 by 16 interface, and the vector engine processor module. The processor module contains memory. And you can see this by, by, these, uh, uh, by the six uh, little uh, chiplets uh, to the side of the central module. The TDP of this card is uh, 300 watts. But uh, let's say for normal uh, workloads, we're well below these 300 watts, uh, as you can see from the plots. So um, ve vector engine processor overview, uh, let's say this is technology uh, done and implemented in 2017. And actually the, the chip came out or the, started selling in 2018. And um, uh, we have eight powerful vector cores um, on a 2D mesh network on chip. Um, the mesh network on chip is uh, very uh, simplified uh, in, in this picture. Uh, I can assure that it has a lot of wires and complexity because it has to wire a lot of banks of memory coming from the HBMs. Then there are um, 60 megabytes of last level cache, which is a vector cache, also used by the scalar units on the cores. We have DMA engines, and we have this express interface, as well as the six HBM2 controllers and interfaces, um, and uh, eight high stacks uh, of the HBMs. So the, the SKUs when the processor came out were these, uh, the 10A, 10B, 10C model, and you see that um, this uh, six HBM2 first implementation of a processor with six HBM2s delivered very high memory bandwidth, 1.22 terabytes per second, and a pretty significant memory capacity with 48 gigabytes. Uh, there was an update uh, in 2019, last year, at the time of the supercomputing, um, we up graded the performance of the HBM2. Now um, the SKUs um, are called 10AE and 10BE, 10CE. Uh, the memory bandwidth of this is 1.35 terabytes per second. And the low end model, which only has four high HBM2 stacks, um, is now also capable of one terabyte per second. So this is a, a nice development processor for like a workstation. A new model will come out uh, this year. So diving into the processor, a core has a vector processing unit, uh, which um, can do 30, 307 gigaflops double precision, 614 gigaflops single precision performance. Each core has access to uh, um, 409 gigabytes per second load and store memory bandwidth. So load and store can happen at the same time. Um, and uh, the cores have a scalar processing unit, which is actually a risk five, uh, not, sorry, not risk five. It is a risk processor, a classical risk processor without of order execution uh, with all the units that uh, uh, you would guess in a normal uh, CPU, 
But of course, this is not designed as a high power scalar processing unit. It is designed as a scalar processing unit, which is supposed to keep the vector unit running and under control. So um, the, uh, what you also see from this sketch is that there is a significant amount of, of, of logic and silicon um, implemented for uh, data transfer and uh, for uh, enabling data movement to the right places. So we have address, and address translation um, engine, which is uh, very wide, uh, and we have a request reply crossbar, which is uh, connecting to this uh, to the memory network uh, in order to support the high memory bandwidths. Also, that what you can guess from this is if one core can do 400 uh, gigabytes per second, then actually three cores are saturating the memory bandwidth of, of this chip. So you will not have the slow scaling of, um, uh, behavior like in um, x86 style CPUs, where you need many cores in order to achieve the big memory bandwidth. With a few cores, you can even you can actually reach the peak bandwidth here. Um, vector processing units. So this is the VPU. Uh, it has four pipelines. Actually, there are six, but uh, two of the ports are reused. So. Uh, Two of the pipelines are uh, fuse multiply add units, which also do integer operations. Then we have another one doing integer operations, multiply mask operations. And uh, there is one pipeline for complex operations, uh, integer adds and store. So um, these pipelines are each 32 way parallel. That means per cycle we can process uh, 32 times 64 bits um, of data. And um, yeah, we are using for single precision packed uh, vector data support. Uh, so we can do two single precision um, operations where we do usually one double precision operation. The vector registers um, are defined in the architecture, in the instruction set architecture, um, uh, there are 64 vector registers, uh, but actually in the background there are 256 physical vector registers such that we can do vector register renaming um, and uh, uh, like, like on scalar CPUs, but with these huge vector registers containing 256 times uh, 64 bit of data. Uh, we do out of order scheduling also in the VPU and um, that's it more or less. Um, when you want to s imagine how this actually, uh, how processing is going, uh, this is the picture one should have in mind. All of these surfaces on the left, uh, left hand side are a vector register and Let's say the highlighted fronts, which is, which are red, uh, green, and blue. These are the SIMD fronts that are processed in one cycle. So you will need eight cycles to process the entire vector register, and you will be processing uh, 32 elements uh, in a cycle, and producing uh, every cycle 32 elements as a result. So that's like uh, 2,048 bits. So the instruction set architecture of the vector unit um, is um, nothing special, I would say. Um, if, if we look at the history of, of vector computers, uh, we have a vector length register. This is something that SIMDs, uh, SIMD vectors are now starting to reinvent with uh, the SVL in, in, in ARM, and I think the RISC-V V extensions also will have a vector length register. Um, otherwise, the vector instruction groups look very much similar to what the scalar instruction groups look like. So we have instructions for nearly everything that we have on the left side. 
Some things are special. We have, for example, recursive relations instructions. That means we can vectorize uh, one step recursion. And we have uh, 2D load store instructions that can load uh, an entire uh, piece of a matrix into a vector register, 2D matrix. So uh, finally, memory subsystem uh, is um, this. So here are some details on the memory subsystem. Uh, um, the, the memory bandwidth available from the last level cache to the, the cores is uh, three terabyte per second. Um, the uh, scalar SPUs have additional caches, a level one instruction and uh, data cache, as well as a level two cache, while the vector processing unit does not have this cache. So it's only cache is the last level cache here. Um, uh, we have two memory networks that's maybe noteworthy. One of them is this 2D mesh network on chip for core memory access, and the other one is a ring bus for DMA and PCI traffic. All right. So now uh, a little comparison to what we had uh, in 1973 with the CDC Star 100, which I started with. Well, this machine had a power consumption of 250 kilowatts. And if I now take uh, A308, which is one of the Aurora type servers at a normal power consumption, then I could stick together 142 of these machines in 2017. So uh, almost uh, 50 years later, not quite, 45 something, um, 48. And the memory bandwidth we had back then was 1.5 gigabytes a second, while now this aggregates to 1.38 petabytes per second. So th that makes a factor of two to the power of 19.7. That is equivalent to a bandwidth doubling every 2.23 years. So you see with the memory bandwidth doubling, we are not so far away from actually what Moore's law predicts. So everybody's complaining memory bandwidth is not growing. Well, it can be grown if you focus on memory bandwidth. And uh, in peak performance, the comparison of these two machines would lead to a performance doubling every 1.7 teams. Well, don't take these two seriously. Of course, we're having just two data points and Moore's law is not exactly right for technology changes. So, but what you can see is uh, we indeed put some effort into the memory bandwidth, and um, that that uh, leads us to a pretty good result over here. How does the machine actually look like from a practical point of view? Well, the vector computer now is not a, a mainframe anymore. It's a card, and this card you are plugging into a Linux machine, so an off-the-shelf uh, operating system of the shelf hardware um, and uh, uh, the way we are uh, building this is that we are running the operating system of the vector engines on the Linux server host. The operating system is called VEOS and in fact the vector applications can do any system calls they usually do on the Linux. And they are offloading this system calls and the system calls are executed inside VOS. So actually the application that you program normally with, with C, C++ or Fortran, um, you use automatic vectorization and parallelization. Um, these are technologies we really uh, evolved during the past decades, uh, this program feels as if it is executed on a Linux system. Here is a, in a little more detail. On the left-hand side, we have the vector host. On the right-hand side, we have vector engines that are plugged into vector hosts. The vector engines have no kernel, but uh, the kernel or the operating system is running on the left-hand side and is actually a daemon running with, the, with root privileges. 
it is connected to a kernel module um, and uh, the user when executing a vector engine program is actually starting a loader of this vector engine program which loads the program into the vector engine but remains um, on the vector host watching this program uh, for exceptions and for system calls. So the system calls of this program, of the vector engine program, are executed actually inside your Linux environment as your Linux user. You can, you can access your files and you can see your, your files from the vector engine. You can write and read and you can even do TCP if you want, although that's great, quite... Uh, a bad idea. So the main targeted usage model of the of the vector engine was this. Uh, that is a native vector engine program. That means you are compiling your program for the vector engine in one of these languages. Uh, we have proprietary Fortran, C, and C++ compilers, which are auto-vectorizing. But we have a very uh, uh, successful effort for porting LLVM to the vector engine uh, right now, including vectorization. So when you run this program on the vector engine, you would be loading it onto the into the vector engine memory, running it. The program could communicate through MPI or could be parallelized by OpenMP and communicate among the cores of this vector engine. If the program happens to do a system call, it does it, uh, then the program is stopped, it diverts to the host, the system call is executed, returns a result, and continues running. A special type of this system call is called VH call, and that is another type of usage or another programming paradigm. So to say, it's a programming paradigm where your native program is on the vector engine, but it can offload some of the computation to the vector host. So you can uh, use this, uh, for example, for I.O. or pre- and post-processing libraries that you are not able to port to the vector engine because maybe the libraries are proprietary or you don't want to port because they don't perform well. So this is a way to hybridize um, native VE programs. The other way to use the machine is to recognize it really as an accelerator. And um, the, the acronym VEO stands for Vector Engine Offloading. And it is a way to actually run hybrid vector host vector engine programs. The main program runs on the vector host. Um, you're uh, having um, multi-threaded programs or interactive programs. Uh, you can have any language in principle and uh, you can have MPI on the vector host side while offloading vector engine kernels like you would actually do it in OpenCL or in CUDA. Okay, so uh, the difference to OpenCL and CUDA is that um, the vector engine offloaded kernels can actually do more. They can call any any kind of system calls in, in these kernels. So um, finally, a uh, third model of programming these systems is hybrid MPI. Hybrid MPI means we compile our binary for both the vector engine and the vector host and then we can run the program on vector engine and vector host. And of course, we need to care about the details inside our program such that these host and engine programs communicate and do the proper thing. And um, that is something we, we have now in, in production. And it's, uh, it's a pretty, it was a pretty easy way for people to convert, for example, complex weather codes into this programming paradigm to, to offload and uh, make asynchronous uh, I.O. processes from a vector, from uh, weather simulations. Benchmarks. Um, that's, this is the final part of my presentation. 
Uh, I'm, I'm starting with something that is bad for us, DGEM. DGEM means, well, is the calculation capability evaluation. So we compare here Xeon performance. Well, this is Skylake Gold, uh, not the latest uh, architecture, but still uh, kind of performance we see nowadays with a Tesla a GPU. And um, then this is the new ARM Fugaku uh, CPU that will be uh, the post-K computer uh, supposed to be released in 2021. This is our Aurora VE10A from 2018, and Aurora VE10AE from 2019. You see, we are not on the level of the GPU. Why? Because we have a different focus. We want to have a balanced processor with good memory bandwidth, where the memory bandwidth also reaches the processing units in a simple way. So we invested silicon into transporting data instead of investing it into just um, um, uh, compute units. Uh, here you see something I cannot show you. This is a Aurora uh, that will come out this year. Fine. So we will have an improvement here, but we are not definitely not aiming to the um, peak computation performance. We are aiming actually to a high performance efficiency. That means we want to use uh, the processor in a good way, and we want to uh, use the power that we put into the processor in an efficient way. So one of the measures or one of the benchmarks for this is HPCG. This is on the left side. You see the HPCG results from June 2019. And what you can see is that, for example, the top 10 average is in the range of 1.3%. That means only 1.3% of these massive peak uh, performance that you can see is normally effectively used in real world applications. Um, with some exceptions, the K computer was an exception with 5.3% efficiency. Uh, it is now dismantled, so it fell out of this list. And uh, down here, uh, you see the Earth Simulator, uh, Osaka University ACE, and NEC SX ACE installation with a performance efficiency in the range of 10 to 11%. Now, the Aurora um, um, performance efficiency is, uh, well, the best one we see is in the range of 6%, which makes it really a good follower of the SX ACE, which still uh, keeps, uh, well, is the strongest one. Uh, why? Well, Aurora has half byte per flop uh, memory bandwidth, while the SX ACE of these computers here uh, have one byte per flop. So you actually see the performance ratio here reflected in the result. Um, again, we compare pretty OK to NVIDIA. Uh, that's the Volta compared to the Aurora result and the Xeon result. Um, that's performance, performance per watt, and uh, metric, uh, uh, which is a bit strange, performance per price. But here uh, we showed it because uh, that kind of uh, highlights that it's it's maybe worth looking at this uh, kind of processor. It also can save you some costs. Um, and down here, you see a curve of power consumption on this machine. So next, Himeno benchmark. In the Himeno benchmark, we are pretty good and can compare to the Tesla, actually exceed the Tesla uh, V100 result. Um, although we have a gap uh, in the peak performance. So the Tesla peak performance is a factor of three above our peak performance, but we lead in the memory bandwidth. So uh, we can overtake them. Now the new uh, Fugaku ARMS A64FX is uh, um, supposedly overtaking us, uh, well, in 2021 officially, but Actually, our processor this year will, yeah, will be a little higher than that, I suppose. Um, another code, and this actually goes 
pretty straight into the stencil codes uh, in comparison to the stencil codes um, is um, Himeno benchmark is a stencil code, right? So uh, we have a stencil code accelerator library on the machine and we compare the stencil code performance uh, with, again, with Xeon performance in blue and uh, NVIDIA performance in, in green. And um, again, we end up kind of leading in, in this area or pretty clearly leading in most of the areas, which shows we can, the, the, the additional memory bandwidth is really a benefit. You don't need a huge compute if your computer is balanced. Here you can see stream scaling. These are results courtesy from uh, Professor Kobayashi from Tohoku University. Uh, you can see here that the Aurora Tsubasa is indeed saturating the stream bandwidth uh, pretty well. So these are results which are more than one year old. Um, and here you see the efficiency of uh, Xeon, uh, Skylake, and you can see that you are reaching the peak stream bandwidth only with using all the cores. <coughs> While with Aurora, you reach it pretty, pretty quickly and you reach a higher efficiency. Fine. Here are some more band, uh, some more kernels from, from their test loop where the blue bar is Aurora versus green is SXACE. Uh, they still have a big SXACE uh, installation and yellow is Skylake. So I think we look pretty good compared to Skylake on all these kernels. Uh, finally, coming to machine learning, uh, hot topic since uh, like two years. Um, we uh, have uh, an adaptation of the Spark, of Apache Spark, a kind of a Spark clone. It's a framework called Frovidis. Uh, it's open source. You can you can access it on the, on the web or at GitHub. And uh, ported the MLlib, the machine learning libraries, um, to that and some other parts of Spark, which are relevant, and we achieve very nice performance. So um, you see here for logistic regression, we get a factor of 100 over the x86 uh, original Spark uh, for um, uh, k-means and SVD, also very decent uh, factors of 40 to 50. Um, the database side of the things also benefits from vector power and the memory bandwidth. So this is data frame, um, uh, vectorized data frame uh, infrastructure also inside Providis, evaluated with TCP, uh, TPCH SF20 benchmarks, um, which are database style benchmarks. Here we reach something like a factor of 10, 30, 40, um, with various operations. Uh, by the way, machine learning, machine learning is the one side, the left side of this plot. Um, we have uh, on the left side, the classical machine learning and database uh, style loads, uh, where we use Spark natively on the vector host, from it is on the vector engines. And you can use something like scikit-learn in Python, also on the vector engines. And then, uh, so in red, you see here the vector ported frameworks. Um, and then for deep learning, we have a neural network optimizer multi-framework uh, solution that we develop in-house uh, at the NEC labs in, in uh, Europe. Um, it is called SOL, and SOL is actually allowing us to use the latest PyTorch or TensorFlow Keras or MXNet frameworks uh, transparently on the vector engine. So we don't actually need to modify PyTorch and TensorFlow Keras in order to be able to use them on the vector engine. There exists a part of TensorFlow, but the SOL part is actually um, superior because it uh, 
optimizes the neural network as well. So uh, in the realm of deep learning, uh, this is where we actually see the aurora. Aurora is in the area where we benefit of memory performance. It is not in the area where uh, raw compute performance uh, is, is uh, needed. So um, we're, we're good at these things like demand prediction. We're also good at uh, multi-layer perceptrons. Uh, it, uh, it seems that uh, transformers are very efficient also on, on Aurora, especially a transformer inference. And uh, we can also do com uh, CNNs, uh, but we don't claim to, uh, we don't have any claim for leadership in that area. That's uh, left to the GPUs. So um, here are some results from Sol on VE. You see, uh, this is results for training uh, batch size uh, 16 uh, FP32. Uh, precision, all the, the vision networks are working and the results are in blue for Xeon, um, Xeon Skylake, uh, in red for uh, on the left side TensorFlow VE and on the right side Sol with PyTorch on the vector engine and in green for a V100 um, processor so a Volta uh, processor. So here we see that in training, we get the expected results. So first of all, we are significantly better than, than the x86 architectures, but um, the, the GPU plays out its benefit in the compute model. On the other side, if you want to connect HPC and AI, then inference is what you will be doing. And Sol allows a very nice integration of optimized networks into the um, into the HPC application. So you can call uh, in your ap application in place the inference. In place means in the same in the same application that actually runs the simulation. You can do the inference and in the same place. You don't need uh, actually additional nodes for for uh, trans for transporting the data to the inference nodes, for example, GPU nodes, you can do that, but you don't need it. So what you see here is a inference in, in an HPC application. You would do inference with batch size one, and that's what we measured here. Um, we sometimes even beat the GPUs, uh, which we're happy about. Uh, but we very constantly end up uh, several factors ahead of the Xeon CPUs. So if you run your HPC application and simulation on uh, an Aurora, you can do inference on the same CPU at the, at, during the simulation. And that's the end of my talk. Uh, coming to the summary, the 6Aurora Tsubasa is a new, new product line of vector supercomputers based on Aurora architecture. The vector capabilities are provided in a standard Linux environment. That could be an ARM or RISC-V based host as well. It doesn't matter too much. System software is open source on GitHub. Uh, if you're fancy to, to uh, fiddle with it, please do. We're happy about feedback. Um, vector engines are very are showing a very high memory bandwidth by using six HPM2s. The vector microarchitecture enhancements show uh, high sustained performance and power efficiency and very competitive performance and power efficiency by using standard programming paradigms and uh, standard programming languages. So we can program the system with, uh, in, in a, as you saw, in a native way uh, with an auto vectorizing C, C++ Fortran compilers. It's easy to use in a Linux environment. You can do hybrid codes. Then we have a project on LLVM uh, porting for the vector engine and an effort for extending LLVM uh, for improving vectorization inside LLVM, basically teaching LLVM to cope with vector masks and vector length registers 
And this effort uh, happens together with the ARM SVE community and the RISC V V community. Um, then we have projects for OMP target offloading by using VO. And there is, for example, a project called heterogeneous active messages that uses C++ template libraries to create uh, heterogeneous programs. There are more projects, but uh, the time is limited. So I'll end the presentation with showing you some links. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Eric. Eric. Well, very, for me, it's uh, such a deja vu, you know, when you're uh, showing the uh, review of uh, vector architectures, it brought me back over 30 years of, 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 of my work in this field. And I have experience with almost every single Cray and, and lots of NEC machines. So that was a very personal uh, touch for me. <laughs> and uh, I would like to, to share with participants uh, few uh, few things one uh, a icm has got the aurora uh, tsubasa machine eight vector machine uh, with sol and uh, everything that you've heard from from eric uh, i'm advertising it because uh, we are still very open to new users so anybody who is listening here and uh, wishes to, to try, please uh, write to us and uh, perhaps I can promise uh, to every everybody, but if, uh, if you have a good, interesting project and if you want to uh, test uh, and do some research, you see either SOL or standard um, HPC loads, uh, we might consider. And the second uh, piece of information is that uh, we've been discussing, ICM has been discussing at the with NEC users group organization, uh, possibility of running NEC users group meeting in Warsaw, Poland. And last year we agreed that it will be run here in May. And of course, uh, because of uh, the epidemic, pandemic, we, we had to, the NEC uh, users group had to change their plans and now Provisionally, we are planning for an EC users group meeting in September, also here in Warsaw. So the place uh, remains the same. And let's hope that, uh, that the uh, epidemic will ease off and, and, and will be uh, clear and we can run this event. So, of course, I uh, inform everybody that uh, there may be more activities and you can uh, have opportunity to learn even more about it. And of course, you can uh, try it. Uh, ICM, of course, you can perhaps in other places. So now, now we have questions to to Eric, and we have it from from Frank. Uh, Eric, can you see the the chat? I the thing? I I switched over the the chat. Yes, uh, Frank Petka asks, um, where do you see future key advantages of Aurora architecture over GPUs? Is your programming will it stay ahead of uh, for real applications? Well. Uh, you actually got it. Yeah, it is. It is an easier way to program uh, because it's it's really embedded. Uh, we don't. We didn't actually mean to compete uh, against CPUs. We are trying to follow this uh, trend of uh, heterogeneity. So, if you have an application that works wonderfully on a GPU, take a GPU for for God's sake. I mean, take it. It's good, uh, but. Um, if you have an application that benefits of high memory bandwidth, like sparse solvers um, uh, do, yes, uh, we heard yesterday something about sparse AI. We are th that is something we really look at. Then uh, I think Aurora will be will be a good system, and we we want to stay ahead in the memory bandwidth uh, question. And as I was trying to say, but maybe it didn't reach uh, this uh, the, the message that is hard to convey. Um, we put a lot of effort in bringing the data to the compute units. That is where we invest silicon. And um, that is one part which is difficult with GPUs. In order to get uh, GPUs performing well, you need to reuse registers a lot. You need to use a lot of threads and so on. So 
for us, we think it is easier to reach good performance. But you still need to think in a data parallel way. So that's that's the thing. Another question is um, from Carol. Can you elaborate on debugging of programs on Aurora? Well, you just call GDB. Uh, there is a GDB implementation for Aurora, which is actually running on uh, on the vector host. Um, also, uh, uh, the ARM DDT debugger is using this, so so you can you can use the ARM DDT debugger. Uh, that that means um, when you debug a program. You can start it in a debugger. You can put your breakpoints where you want. You can use it as a normal program, um, as a normal Linux program, more or less. Finally, uh, is Java available on nodes? Uh, simple answer, no, sorry. Um, but a Java native interface for C is possible. So you can call into optimized routines. So that's nothing hinders you to do that. Eric, I, I have two questions. One is that uh, in, oh, actually I have more than that, maybe three at least. One, in your benchmark uh, results, you are uh, comparing uh, Aurora, let's say one unit with uh, Xeon or some of the other, you know, for V100. But when you when you show the results for for vector, for Aurora, is it only for vector engine for single vector engine, or what's the role for host in, in these benchmarks? The, these were purely vector engine benchmarks. Uh, benchmarks. The host was not involved in them. Okay. Yeah, only in the support role of starting the program and handling. Right. The right. Now, second question is. Uh, uh, how about the mathematical libraries? You know, on x86 you have uh, you have MKL, on uh, even on ARM you have uh, NE, NAG libraries and so forth. Yes. Do, do you have libraries specific for for vector engine? Sure. Yeah. So basically, if you if you purchase an Aurora, you get uh, the SDK for it. SDK contains compilers, MPI, and something called NLC, the NEC library collection. On my last slide. Uh, there is a link to hpc.nec slash documents. If you go there, you will find the documentation for this NEC library collection. You have their uh, optimized uh, BLAS, uh, Linpack, something called ASL containing FFTs, uh, sparse, uh, sparse solver, sparse direct solver, this uh, uh, stencil accelerator library, and all sorts of things. <laughs> so have a look. Okay. And if you look for something, please email me. We should we should find out how we can support you. Well, it's so so interesting, Eric. Just one last question. I had the impression that the in the, first of all in the product line from NEC, you you also have very very large systems, multi rack uh, sort of approaching peta uh, scale. What is the largest system that NEC realized of that kind? Um, we we have two two large installations. One is now ongoing. Uh, it's the German Weather Service with the, a range of something above five thousand vector engines. But the system is a hybrid system consisting of of uh, scalar, uh, AMD, uh, Rome. Uh, servers and these two U high density vector engines, and then we have another big. So, so that's the order of magnitude. Uh, five thousand, five thousand five hundred vector engines is an installation, and uh, another big installation is uh, the Center for Fusion Re Fusion Research in Japan. Uh, also, that order of magnitude of size. Yeah. So, okay. Uh... I really enjoyed your talk. I hope everybody else uh, did it as well. So thank you very much. And we are